welcome. Glad you're here. Party people, don't forget to enter that giveaway to win the Nintendo Switch. Super important because you could win a Nintendo Switch. Yes, the real deal, not like the light one or, you know, like just the controllers or anything like that. The real Nintendo Switch. We have purchased it. It is on its way and somebody's going to win it. Here's how you can win it. If you're watching live, type something in the, in the chat, in the live chat. Just say hi. We want to know if you're there. Second, you can also get an entry if you come to the live Zoom after this video premieres, which is, of course, on Wednesday nights. If you're not watching then, you can go to our Instagram, which is right here. Find the post. It's the most recent post that talks about the giveaway. Make sure to like that post. You can comment on the post and you can tag some friends. And that is all entry worthy. We are going to do a live drawing on Instagram Live Thursday, yes, Thanksgiving Day at noon, at noon Central Standard Time. We're going to draw names out of a hat. I'm probably going to get one of my kids to do it, so you know I'll have no biases or anything. I would never do that. No one biases. Anyway, there's another new segment coming at you. Now for a new segment we like to call Thanksgiving Hot Takes, where folks give us their piping hot, scorching, sizzling, steaming off the grill hot takes about Thanksgiving. Thanksgiving, a holiday celebrated on a Thursday over 300 years ago when the pilgrims met the Native Americans. Uh, I don't like cranberries. I don't think they should be on the Thanksgiving menu. Um, I think we should have uh, like grapes or pineapple or something because cranberry is too sour and yeah. People who eat chicken on Thanksgiving are treasonous. Wouldn't you agree, Charlie? Yeah, look at that face. He agrees. And there's... That's my hottest Thanksgiving take. Hmm. Well, I mean, for this one specifically, I'm pretty glad that we're going back to our roots of, you know, further spreading disease to a continent. So it's it's nice to see. First Samuel 24 verses 1 through 7. After Saul returned from pursuing the Philistines, he was told, David is in the desert of En Gedi. So Saul took 3,000 able young men from all Israel and set out to look for David and his men near the crags of the wild goats. He came to the sheep pens along the way. A cave was there, and Saul went in to relieve himself. David and his men were far back in the cave. The men said, This is the day the Lord spoke of when he said to you, I will give your enemy into your hands for you to deal with as you wish. Then David crept up unnoticed and cut off a corner of Saul's robe. Afterward, David was conscience stricken for having cut off a corner of his robe. He said to his men, The Lord forbid that I should do such a thing to my master, the Lord's anointed, or lay my hand on him, for he is the anointed of the Lord. With these words, David sharply rebuked his men and did not allow them to attack Saul. And Saul left the cave and went his way. 
Matthew 5, verses 38 through 45. You have heard that it was said, eye for eye and tooth for tooth. But I tell you, do not resist an evil person. If anyone slaps you on the right cheek, turn to them the other cheek also. And if anyone wants to sue you and take your shirt, hand over your coat as well. If anyone forces you to go one mile, go with them two miles. Give to the one who asks you, and do not turn away from the one who wants to borrow from you. You have heard that it was said, love your neighbor and hate your enemy. But I tell you, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you, that you may be the children of your Father in heaven. He causes his son to rise on the evil and the good, and sends rain on the righteous and the unrighteous. Okay, so when I was 10 years old, I almost killed my mom's boss on the go-kart track. Here's the story. I'm a pretty competitive guy. I hate losing. Now, like, as a responsible, mature adult, I've come to accept that it happens sometimes. But when I was a kid, I did not take losing well at all. If somebody beat me at something, it became my life's journey to end them. Winning wasn't just enough. I wanted to make sure they never wanted to play again. Super healthy, right? So when I was 10 years old, my family went to an amusement park with some friends of ours and their kids. One of the things that they had at this park was go-karts. Now, I love go-karts. They're super fun, always a good time. Maybe someday when we are allowed to leave our homes, we can all go go-karting together or something. But anyway, we're out there racing my family and this other family who we're really good friends with. I'm in one of those solo cars and the dad and the son from the other family are in one of those two-seater cars. I'm in the lead and I'm trying to hold them off. We go into a turn and they manage to kind of nudge me just enough to spin my car around, which gets me stuck in one of the barricades on the side of the track. Which is honestly really normal stuff for go-karting, happens all the time. No big deal, right? All I had to do was sit there and wait for the track employee to come and get me unstuck and get me back on the track. But I am livid. I mean, I was winning and these clowns are just gonna spin me out like that? Absolutely not, this cannot stand. I need to catch up and destroy them. But I'm way behind, so what do I do? Well, as luck would have it, I noticed there's a slowdown up ahead because of another mini spin out, and I see that my rivals are at a dead stop. They're sitting ducks. So I hit the gas, and I get going top speed, which is really like 20 miles an hour, but whatever. I am overcome with the need for revenge, and I slam into them full speed in the back of their car. Their car shoots forward like 20 feet. Their heads are bobbing back and forth. And it was at this exact moment that I realized, oh snap, I could have seriously hurt these people. And I was so upset with myself. How could I let myself have such a terrible idea? They were super mad at me. My mom and dad were mad at me. I got kicked out of the go-kart track. That's probably the worst thing out of all of this. Thankfully, they were not hurt. And 25 years later, my mom now happens to work for that same guy at his business. And I've carried this guilt with me for years, so I finally said something to him and said, hey man, I'm really sorry that I did that. That was not cool. And you know what he said? He said, I don't even know what you're talking about. I mean, let's be honest, he probably doesn't remember because of like the concussion, but whatever. I tell you that awful story to tell you this. Sometimes you get hurt by somebody and you wanna have revenge on them. You just wanna have that revenge. And this is kind of complicated, right? Like when we're hurt, we of course wanna stick up for ourselves and hold people accountable for their actions. But there's that whole like thing about like in the Bible that Jesus says we should be nice. But like, how do we balance accountability with grace and forgiveness? Does forgiving someone mean pretending like the hurt never happened? And when do we need to seek justice and when do we need to just let something go? I think there's something in all of us that loves to hate. And when someone hurts us, it's a great excuse to make that person the object of our hatred. And in the Bible, there's this guy named David who had this exact opportunity because David had been chosen by God to be the next king of Israel. He was being hunted by the current and very jealous king, Saul. David had every reason to hate Saul. I mean, the guy was literally trying to kill him, but because David knew God and David followed God, he knew there was a better way. And instead of returning Saul's hatred with more hatred, David chose to show Saul mercy and patience instead. Although David wasn't perfect, certainly, his choices here remind us of what God invites us all to do, to love the people we want to hate. So then we fast forward and we have this part of Jesus' Sermon on the Mount in Matthew chapter five that we just heard a minute ago, and as he often does, Jesus flips the script on the world's wisdom about love and hate. Instead of telling his audience to love those who love them and hate those who hate them, 
Jesus challenged them and us to do something new, to love our enemies. Although David lived many years before Jesus spoke these words, he understood that God wouldn't want him to return Saul's hatred with more hatred. His decision to show Saul love instead of vengeance points to Jesus' challenge for us to do that very thing, love the people we want to hate. Now, real quick, I want to talk about that part in Matthew 5 where it says, turn the other cheek, because I think it's really misunderstood. When Jesus said, turn the other cheek, he didn't mean never stand up for yourself. He didn't mean let people walk all over you because those are really unhealthy things to do. Jesus had no problem verbally defending himself. That was not a problem he had. But Jesus never sought revenge and he was never cruel to others or escalated a conflict because his pride was hurt. Here's what I think Jesus did mean when he said, turn the other cheek. When someone attacks, hurts, or lashes out at you, don't be overcome by anger. Don't plot your revenge. Don't escalate the situation and don't react without thinking. Instead, respond wisely. So like Jesus said, and like David did, God's challenge to you is to love the people you want to hate. Let's see how it changes you. Let's see how it changes them. And let's see how it changes the world. Let